Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here for a third time with Bo Weingard. And today we're going to talk about some tweets that he made his, uh, regarding intellectuals and some of the vices and faults and defects of intellectuals, let's say. So, <laughs> Bo, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show again. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Okay, so let's go tweet by tweet. The first one I have here is... Don't trust intellectuals and when they are the last people who actually experience the consequences of their own ideas. So, you, you were here <laughs> talking about intellectuals in general, or are you referring, for example, to the sort of situation that we have right now in academia, for example, where uh, with time more and more we're seeing that for, uh, for example, far leftist people are putting out ideas that then are picked up by, for example, governmental organizations or something like that. And then uh, mm -hmm. it's common people suffering from the ideas that come from the intellectual elite and not they themselves. Right. So I think I, I'll preface this since we're probably going to derogate intellectuals a good deal during this conversation that yeah. I think intellectuals are probably both like better and worse for the world. So, so they make a greater contribution probably to civilization than the average person. And that's in no ways to disparage that average person, but it's just they have more influence. Um, and often that can be good, but often it can be pretty bad. And because I think we're going through a period in which I'm rather disgusted by the mainstream view of the intellectual elites, I probably am sort of more sympathetic to populism than I usually would be. Um, so, and yeah, I mean, I think there, the, the point is, I guess that, I mean, Taleb wrote a book, you know, Skin in the Game, right? The, the idea that people who don't suffer the consequences of their ideas or, or don't have to compete somehow in the marketplace, they can forward great sounding ideas, noble sounding ideas, very moral sounding ideas, and even degrade people who don't agree with those ideas, even though they're not the ones who, who have to suffer the consequences. So I always saw a good example of this was a lot of the professors uh, who, I won't name names, but a lot of the professors I've known who are advocates of diversity and champions against racism live in these very white picket fence neighborhoods, some with gated protection. And I thought, okay, well, yeah, it's easy to talk about how great diversity is and how you should treat everybody equally and you shouldn't say these awful things about groups of people and crime when you get to live in a neighborhood where the average house is $500,000 and there's literally a, a gate that you have to punch a code into to get into. So th that's, I think, what sort of irritates me about some of those ideas and the moral grandstanding that's not uh, backed up by actual experience. Mm -hmm. And you are irritated by the fact that many times they are moralizing or trying to put down people from the, let's say, the working class, people that right. are uneducated and they, people that uh, didn't go to college or university and so th that can't play uh, intellectually at the same level, let's say. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, I mean, we could distinguish between, you know, sort of like mental horsepower and then like, uh, what would you say, like mental accuracy, maybe. So, so intellectuals, on average, have more mental horsepower than that than an average person, obviously, that doesn't mean their views are necessarily more accurate. Um, so that's one thing that's important to know. But then, yes, it's, um, you know, immigration, I think, actually matches this pattern quite a bit because 
more educated people actually derive more benefits from immigration, both culturally and probably economically, right? Whereas less educated people, people who grew up in communities that had certain norms and traditions, and they're tied to those norms and traditions, they see immigration as more of a threat because they're not as adaptable to a changing environment. And that's okay. I mean, you know, like I'm not, it's not bad necessarily not to be adaptable, uh, but intellectuals treat it that way and they insult people and say you're xenophobic or parochial or closed-minded or you just think of all the kind of insults that mean localist, right? Um, but it's easy to do that again when you reap most of the benefits and don't have to pay the costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so another tweet was one reason the intellectual elite are sometimes so loud and histrionic is because they no longer have control overall can do it. So w what were you talking about here? Yeah, I think I think that's an interesting um, trend in the past. I don't know, 20 years or so. Right. With the Internet opening up many different conduits of information and new publications, things like Quillette and, you know, Arch Digital, Aereo, lots of different kinds of online magazines, online talk sites, Twitter, Facebook, all of these areas, arenas in which anybody can post their opinion. So if you go back and say you go to like 1960 or something, if you wanted to get your opinion out to a reasonable sized audience, you had to go through a bunch of sentinels who controlled access to media. And, and there, you know, you could argue that there's, you know, there's something good about that, that you're filtering out, you know, irresponsible opinions or something. I'm not going to put a moral judgment on it yet, but it's clearly the case that that has opened the, the market has opened up and there are a lot more views that get into the main well not the mainstream right but at least into the public domain than they used to and i think that has caused a lot of fear dis you know uh, dis consternation among people who are used to having views filtered out and, it, and maybe I'd have to think this through and maybe we could think it through, but maybe part of the cancel culture phenomenon is a, is a attempt to use like a grassroots canceling that used to be accomplished by more elite uh, editors who controlled the content. I'm not sure if that's true, but that would be one hypothesis is that it's sort of a replacement filtering mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I think that even on online platforms like Twitter, Facebook and so mm -hmm. on, they are already trying to fight back with, yes. for example, formulating vaguely vague definitions of hate speech, for example, where it serves one side and not the other because for example if you see someone that is that identifies as well let's say some someone from uh, an lgbt group that is bashing white men and white fragility and whiteness <laughs> in general on twitter even if it is clearly offensive and if it if it is at least in my opinion a form of hate speech hate speech because you're grouping uh, people fr uh, that simply have the same skin color and uh, bringing uh, trying to bring them down with one single tweet or two or whatever. I, I mean, uh, that, that is not taken down and that is not considered a speech, but, but if it's the reverse, then, I mean, people can even at, have their tweet accounts uh, cancelled or something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that, I mean, I actually, I, I'm embarrassed to say that I did not realize that there was an entire area of studies called whiteness studies. And the way that the people talk in this area, because I, I went down this rabbit hole when that, there was a, I, th I believe it was a professor who wrote this tweet, like abolish whiteness. And I was like, what? Like abolish whiteness? Like that sounds pretty extreme, right? <laughs> but, but that's actually not 
in that domain, which admittedly is a minority, of course, of like progressive critical theorists or whatever, but within that area, saying something such as abolish whiteness is actually totally normal. Well, it's just like, <laughs> and that's amazing to me. So, but yes, you're right. I mean, I, I think you're right. It's, it's that th they are starting to implement kinds of uh, filtering processes. And I'm disconcerted by it too, because you're right. I mean, it, it, you make this vague definition and then it, it, there's clearly double standard. So you can say abolish whiteness. It, it, can you imagine the fear if you said abolish blackness? I mean, you would get... Oof utterly destroyed as i think you should i think you shouldn't say either of those things although i would be i think i would just get rid of the concept of hate speech and and you know like look if twitter wants to regulate some things fine but make it very clear you know don't rely on this nebulous concept that can then be weaponized against one group and not against another another thing for example is and this is interesting because obviously I I write many controversial tweets and I, I talk about human variation, which can get people in trouble and has obviously got me in trouble. One thing I don't tweet about is um, transgender issues. And the reason I don't is because one, I don't know as much about it. But two, I don't even know the Twitter rules on it. I, I'm actually like afraid that something I would say would count as misgendering, I guess is the term that they use. And you can get canceled, like canceled from Twitter for misgendering somebody. And it's not even clear to me exactly what that means. Like I tried to look at the, the, um, the regulation, the rules or whatever, and it wasn't entirely clear. So you're right. I think there are these replacement filters that mostly progressives because they control most of the like more mainstream media are putting into place as a substitute for the ones that used to prevail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one thing that is very sad, let's say, I think, is that some of the groups that, int that a certain intellectual elite are targeting right now are groups of people that, in fact, are victims or at, at least important victims of the, the exact kind of, kinds of behaviors that they are condemning, like, for example, when they talk against men, men, for example, are most of the victims of homicide, of suicide, and mm -hmm. uh, and and even sometimes, and even, I mean, even in terms of domestic violence, it's more or less it's, 50 It's 50. even about, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So th that's, uh, there's also that. Well, that's an interesting one. I mean, that's an interesting case. I think um, it's, one has to say it's a, a, a pretty marvelous achievement of feminist slash pr progressive propaganda to make people believe that we inhabit overwhelmingly misogynistic societies when almost all of the, the data would tell you the opposite, right? I mean, in terms of outcomes, women, th the only thing men basically are, are have better outcomes at is at the tail end of like wealth and power. It is true that they're concentrated up there, likely for evolutionary reasons, for reasons of natural differences. But when you look at like all of these other things, you know, rates of violent victimization, suicide, homelessness, incarceration, likelihood of getting shot by the police, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah, it's the case that clearly men have a worse time in society. Now, I think one could make a reasonable argument that men also cause a lot of problems. That is, they they perpetrate violence much more, and, and that's fair. But the notion that we're inhabiting this misogynistic patriarchy is just baffling to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's, so, that's kind of another point. <laughs> yeah, that's completely <laughs> aside. Okay, yeah. so l let's go to another tweet. Intellectuals are really good at catastrophizing. They believe that things matter much more than they actually do, and then they try to save the world from various imminent dangers. It happens <laughs> on both the right and the left. The boring truth is things aren't that bad. Yeah. I'm going to hold myself 
culpable of doing this, but then say things maybe are that bad. So am I just a catastrophizing intellectual now or am I right? I don't know. <laughs> because I don't, when did I say that? What, what date was that? Do you know? Oh my God. I, I didn't write that down. So. Okay. So after the death of George Floyd, especially in the United States, things have become crazy and I do think so I do think there is a tendency to be paranoid and to see danger everywhere and then to get animated by the idea that you're in a righteous crusade against some sort of threat and that gives people meaning and I think intellectuals do that quite a bit and I'm sure I have those same propensities. On the other hand, I actually am concerned, <laughs> even though right now I would still say mo the modern West is a great place to live right now still, despite all of the things one might say about it. Right at this moment, it, it's hard to complete. Even with, even with the pandemic, it's still pretty decent. Mm -hmm. I am worried, however, that in 20 years, it will be harder to say that because there are some disconcerting trends. And so maybe either I'm, I'm right about that or I'm falling prey to the very tendency that I was sort of mocking or at least uh, drawing attention to in that tweet. But I, I do think it is definitely true that we like to do that. We need I, I suppose that's not exclusive to intellectuals. I think humans, especially men, but probably humans in general, n need a, a kind of tribal competition. Uh, they need something that gets them up in the morning, something they feel as though they're doing in a righteous cause. What's what's more exhilarating than that, than feeling that I'm in this I'm in this group and what I'm doing is so important. I'm saving Western civilization. <laughs> right um, or or i'm saving people of color from exploitation and oppression and i'm saving women from patriarchs etc mm -hmm. yeah that, that bit about saving western civilization it's one of i mean that sometimes makes me giggle a little bit because i mean i, I don't see any signs of western civilization crumbling or going down or going into ruin anytime <laughs> soon <laughs> yeah i mean if you get me in a bad mood, I'm like, oh, it's done for the West. But that is obviously hyperbolic. I, I, yeah. I don't see that either. Although I do, I mean, I guess what I would say is another conversation that would last two hours. But I, I think there are a, a few norms that I think are important that I'm a little worried about that are, are maybe fraying at the edges. But that's, yeah, yeah I, I think you're right. Ultimately, it's not. I don't think I'm going to wake up tomorrow and Western civilization is going to hit its end, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the next one probably is more interesting to, to talk about. Intellectuals often claim from Socrates forward that the unexamined life isn't worth living, but that is completely untrue. I imagine that the life spent with family, friends and community is worth living even without self reflection so that that's an, another way that intellectuals try to bash uh, or to I, I mean in in any way shape of or form to try to minimize the intellect of people that are not at the same level because they say that if you don't examine your life basically it's not worth living so <laughs> <laughs> well, which is a it, what's interesting is I remember that tweet and I stand behind that one and I got a lot of pushback out there and I thought, I mean, it's just so bizarre to suggest that somebody who lives a very you know productive, collaborative life but doesn't sit around pondering the meaning of it, that that life is somehow not important compared to somebody who sits around waxing eloquently about existential despair and what's the meaning of life, but doesn't really collaborate with anyone or accomplish anything. But 
I, I have a, a, a sort of fundamental axiom is that people tend to uh, argue that whatever it is they're good at should be more valued in society, right? So if you're good at thinking, you're like, everyone should value thinking. If you're good at sports, sports are great, everyone should value them, etc. And so when a philosopher says the unexamined life isn't worth living, what the philosopher is basically saying, I think when you translate it, is you should pay more attention to me and value me more because I think a lot and I'll teach you how to think a lot, right? <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I actually... I, I think that's a really bizarre, it, it is, it's very popular. And look, like I'm one of the more philosophical people that I know. So I'm not suggesting that I don't like philosophers. I do. I love philosophy, but I think we have to be less narcissistic and more understanding that our peculiar mental traits are maybe not that great for society. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't care, and that's fine. I don't think LeBron James's life is less important than mine because he's not thinking about deontological morality or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and even another point would be that people that don't do a lot of self-reflection, many of them are basically the pillars of our society because they mm -hmm. they have to do the work the hard and nasty work that intellectuals don't want to do and if they refuse to do it then uh, we wouldn't even have a civilization so yeah right exactly i mean we, we who, you know, who's doing construction work or whatever. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be out there. I'm too weak to do it. <laughs> I, and I'm lucky that I have a peculiar mix of intellectual traits and opportunity. And I can sit around thinking about what did Plato mean on page 221 of the Republic. I think it's, it's just... Yeah, it's it's utterly baffling to me that we would expect everyone to uh, enjoy, appreciate that that kind of a lifestyle and, de and and actually demean people who don't. And also, if you think of our like a lot of the problem with I mean, this is maybe more with like the prof professor's views of the education system. But like part of my problem with college is this idea that everyone should be reading Socrates, uh, well, not Socrates, but Socrates as told by Plato, Aristotle, Hegel even, uh, you know, Herman Melville, James Joyce, whatever. No, they shouldn't. A lot of people aren't going to get anything from that. And if you put them in a classroom and you force them to read Moby Dick and discuss it every week, it would be like forcing me to play basketball with people who are three times better than I am. Yeah. It would be incredibly demeaning to me and frustrating and annoying. And at some point I would just tune out and say, I'm not going to try anymore. This is ridiculous. I hate it. Right. And then it would be as if to add <laughs> insult to injury, those basketball players got together and they said, a life in which you can't dunk a basketball isn't worth having. <laughs> you know, like that's like the equivalent of that attitude. Uh, I, I, I do. I think it's one of the things I, 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 th I just think like the whole IQ problem and dealing with higher and lower levels of IQ humanely and creating a humane society for people who don't have. 120 IQs, 130 IQs is one of the biggest challenges we face. And one thing that I find maybe even repugnant about today's progressive intellectual class is that they basically they either deny the problem because they act as though IQs like what's that? It's not measuring anything. Who cares? Or they act as though everybody could do this if they just tried. It's just a matter of application or getting people into the right schools, whatever. And so you end up berating public education because some people can't learn. They're not going to ever, no matter what you do. They end up berating people who don't want to live that kind of a lifestyle. And they end up uh, 
ignoring instead of attempting to face head on this major problem of groups coming apart, you know, the cognitive elite and uh, and everybody else, basically. So all of that plays into that. And that's one of my major concerns with intellectuals and progressivism, which I tend to see. I, I share some of the progressives economic vision on society. But one of the problems I see with progressivism is precisely that it's this uh, it's a political ideology that appeals to hyper-educated people and and people of color, but a lot of hyper-educated people, and therefore it reflects the interests of hyper-educated people. Yeah, and so I think that this previous tweet makes a good uh, follow-up, or follow-up, no, the, the next tweet makes a good follow-up to the previous one, the, that is the great mistake that intellectuals make is that knowledge must be articulable. Most knowledge mm -hmm. is intuitive and most articulation is erroneous. That one I'm going to give credit for. That was a good tweet of mine. I, I still, that holds up well. <laughs> I got a lot of pushback on that one too, as I recall. And I actually, I think that's quite right, is that most people's, most people's knowledge of the world and even what they're doing, I think, is more like riding a bicycle than it is... Uh, you know, writing a sentence of poetry or, or writing an iambic pentameter where you can say, I could say to you to write an iambic pentameter, you do this, we could articulate it, etc. If I had to tell you how to ride a bike, I would be clueless about, I'd say, get on it and pedal, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Because it's something that you just, it, 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 you learn through experience and you, you, there's no way to articulate it because your your conscious mind doesn't know how you do it. Intellectuals tend to value one kind of knowledge and to insist that we should transform all knowledge into that kind of knowledge. And yeah, that that's a serious mistake. Now, I understand why they do it because, you know, if you're trying to have a rational debate about something, you need to attempt to articulate it. You need to try to say, what are the principles and stakes involved here? Problem is, often that ends up just falsifying or distorting what you really think or mean because you don't know how to articulate it. And you know, there's that great, um, I, I wish I can't remember the, the justice who said this, but you know, there's that very famous saying about basically, I don't know what, uh, I can't tell you what pornography is, but I know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And often that's actually, that's mocked and sort of criticized as being, well, you, whatever. But that's actually true, right? This is a point that Wittgenstein made a lot in his philosophy, which is like, you can't necessarily articulate all of the rules that your mind is, at least as if instantiating to figure something out. Like I, so let's say you and I are like, what makes a game? This is Wittgenstein's example. What's a game? Is Monopoly a game? Yes, we would say yes. But imagine now we have to articulate all of the principles that uh, discriminate a game from something else. Could we do it? I would submit no. We would have a really hard time. Yet if somebody asked us each example, like, you know, is hopscotch a game? We could say yes or no pretty well because we have this intuitive knowledge but if we try to articulate it, not only can we not articulate it, but we'll probably end up falsifying what we already kind of know intuitively in that process. So that's what I was trying to get at. And I guess people saw that as conservative Kant or something. They were, they were, you know, like justification for conservatism or whatever. Um, I don't think it is. I just think it's a fact about humans that when we provide reasons about things, they're often not accurate. If people ask you, why did you do what you did? You often provide an inaccurate, you know, this is something where you and I both, I think we had fun bashing Freud, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But we both agree. Okay, so but we both agree, I think that one thing Freud was right about, at least, is the idea that we don't know our own sort of motive, the, our motivations. Our motivations kind of hide beneath the surface of the water and we can't really see them well. And so in some sense, we're inventing motivations or 
trying to figure ourselves out in the same way we would try to figure something else out. And we're often just wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and th that also connects a little bit with, I think, uh, Sperber's and Mercier's uh, argumentative theory of reasoning, because basically we don't use reason to try to get that objective truth. We use reason mostly or most of the time to try to convince other people to come up, uh, to come up with justifications from our acts to give to other people, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it, right. So it's a, uh, I don't know if I would go 100% Sperber and Mercier, but I, w I think they make some pretty compelling arguments that reasoning is definitely a social phenomenon and what what we're often doing and you just think about how when when do people compel you to to reason it's often when you're attempting to justify something why did you do this what are you doing what did you do that for and so it makes sense that the the i mean whatever if you think it's a module or whatever whatever it is that that allows you to reason it makes sense that that mechanism would be good at providing justifications that make you look better <laughs> and that convince people that what you were doing was noble etc so yeah i think all of this now th these are sort of uh inchoate thoughts floating around i've thought for a while of i would really like to write a book defending conservatism from an evolutionary perspective and sort of like laying out the case and then putting all of this kind of together and laying out the case uh, that conservatism, at, at least social conservatism, is very congruent with what we know about human nature. And this is just one example, or this is, you know, these ideas, are a couple examples of that basic idea that wisdom, a lot of wisdom is intuitive and it's hard to actually put it into reason and the same thing with institutions, right? Institutions have wisdom in the same way that individual bodies do that we, we might be completely ignorant of. So, you know, if you ask like, why is the speed limit 35 on this road? You might have no clue, but it might turn out that actually, you know, there's this curve around that you can't see and a lot of people died there in the 70s or whatever. And so they changed the speed limit. That's just one small example of an institutional rule or norm that you, you can see the progressives like, oh, the speed limit is 35, that's stupid, tear it down, we'll put up 65. The conservatives' attitude's a little bit like, you know what, maybe it's been here for a while, maybe it actually serves a purpose, even though we don't know what it is or can't articulate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and social conservatism is precisely the topic of the next tweet that is social conservatism is so unpopular among intellectuals because it contends that the intellect is not particularly helpful for designing social policy. Try selling anti-athleticism to the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think that is one reason is because it, it, it that's exactly correct. I mean, I mean, the argument of social conservatism is that each person is kind of ignorant and many of the things that lead to successful institutions are just trial and error, right? It's just you get together to try to solve a problem, you create something, and that cultural thing whatever it is we'll just call it a cultural institution it evolves through selection in the same way that organisms do and in fact this is one thing that i was thinking about with um i, I think both you and i were talking about henrik's book the secret yeah. of our success right well that's another the cultural evolution actually i think supports a socially conservative view of the world because the argument is it's not that any individual is that smart if you if you drop me in Antarctica, I'd be dead quickly, right? Because I have no idea, even, even if I read books about it, I would really probably not be able to create any of the implements that I need to survive there. What makes humans particularly uh, successful as a species is precisely cultural evolution in that we, we have certain tendencies to imitate other people, you know, copy what they're doing, and then we can create these institutions that evolve over time. I think if you were to put um, 
sort of progressivism on one end and social conservatism on the other. As you get closer to progressivism, you start to think that reasoning and reflection serve a greater role or should serve a greater role in society and that what you should do is step back as maybe they did in the French and the Russian revolutions and rationally criticize society and then create institutions from your reason. Well, we, we'll reason this out and we'll create this rational institution. Now, my argument would be that generally leads to disaster and that I think the social conservative is more correct than the progressive. I would say, of course, there's a there's room for uh, reasoning and for criticism, and those things actually help in institutions get better. But let's be humble about it, and let's not tear down. Here's a good example. Mm -hmm. My attitude toward I, I'm still an atheist, but my attitude toward religion when I was 18 or 19 was much more hostile than it is yeah. now because I thought, oh well, the metaphysics are preposterous, and it made me angry that people told me this or whatever. Um, so the rational me, if you will, would have said, let's get rid of it. Let's just argue against it, point out how preposterous the metaphysics are and, and you know, eradicate religion, this sort of backward phenomenon, as I saw it, from society. Now, a social conservative, even an atheist one would have told me, you know what, religion's been around for a long time it probably serves an important function in society and maybe you should be a little less gung-ho about trying to tear it down. And 40-year-old me looks at the world and thinks, you know what, this woke stuff that has replaced religion is a lot worse than Christianity, a lot worse than the Christianity I was around. And maybe, the, maybe it's correct that it's not a good idea to get rid of a... a, a a belief system and an institution that evolved with society for you know 16 1700 years and so has been disciplined by trial and error with the needs of humans in their social context and now you're replacing it with this relatively new anti-religious uh, I'm sorry anti-racist fervor that has not dealt with society that's more created like rationally through criticisms of all of these things i would say a misunderstanding of things but that's a different story so th that's a good example i think where the social conservative would have been correct that we should be cautious about that and even if you think rationally maybe this thing is absurd or you can find faults here and there be careful about criticizing it i'm not saying don't criticize it but be careful about it Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even within the realm of social conservatism, there's that thing that if something has been around for such a long time, then probably it is because it brings to society some tools or, so, or some benefits that probably we don't understand how they work or where they come from, but that w work. So, Yeah, yeah, like, I mean, like, maybe an example would be Imagine, uh, that, that's a great point. So imagine, you know, they're, they're, we look at pocket watches. People, let's say people have been making pocket watches for 800 years and there's always this part in the pocket watch and you and I are looking at it and we're like, why is this part there? How stupid is that? I think a social conservative would say, you know what, if the part has been there for 800 years, it's probably because it's doing something, otherwise it wouldn't be there, right? And that's the same thing with the institution is, if the institution has managed to survive for 1500 years, it's probably because it's doing something. Otherwise, it probably would have perished. Um, and I think that's a good default argument. Now, you can see, and so let's, I guess, to steel man the, the sort of opponent of social conservatism, they would say, well, sure, slavery has been around or had been around for a long, long time, right? And it was appropriate to criticize it and to abolish that institution. And that's where I would say, yes, <laughs> sometimes that is true. And so I think a good social conservative has to understand that there is some merit to rational reflection and criticism and at least be uh, humble about 
his or her own narrative as much as the progressive should be and say, it's probably not the whole story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and earlier you mentioned the work by Joe Henrik and I, it came to my mind that, uh, I mean, no one planned ahead of time to create a, or to develop a sort of weird psychology as we have it. So when in his right. work he talks about, and the next book of his will be about that, uh, when he talks about uh, how by prohibiting marriage between second or third degree or whatever cousins, mm -hmm. uh, the Catholic Church basically paved the way toward us becoming uh, psychologically peculiar and economically prosperous, let's say. Mm -hmm. No one planned that ahead of time. They just did that for, I mean, I, I don't even know the exact reason why they prohibited marriage between cousins, but anyway, that, that's what happened, and that's basically if uh, Enric is right and he presents a lot of evidence that goes along with it, uh, then that, that's the origin of all of it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, let me just take a moment here to give a shout out to somebody on Twitter named HBD Check who also has a blog, and she does a lot of stuff on this and talks about the Hajnal line, which is that line that runs across Eastern Europe, past which the marriage pattern changes. So on the Western side of it, you get this you know, more prohibition against second, third cousin marriage. People uh, tend to marry later in life outside of family. On the eastern side of it, you get a different marriage pattern. And you find that there are a lot of social correlates of this. So what you're talking about with the weird psychology that is, see if I remember the acronym now, Western, educated, industrialized, uh, rich, and democratic? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so this weird psychology is, you get it on the western side of the Hajnal line. Part of the reason is because of this marriage that you're talking about minorialism is something that HBD chick has pointed to. Um, and the reason I give her credit is because she's written a lot about these ideas. And unfortunately, people often don't reference her because she makes the argument, I think for two reasons. One, she's HBD chick. So, you know, <laughs> but two, she makes an evolutionary, a genetic argument, which Henrik accepts could be possible, but clearly doesn't want to emphasize because then it would get him in hot water. So he likes to focus more on the cultural aspect. Of course, gene culture co-evolution, the whole point is, you know, the two, you know, the, the genes lead to the culture, the culture lead to the genes. So they go hand in hand, obviously. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, you're right. You, you, nobody planned this. No, no genius got together with another genius and thought, you know, uh, if we create these institutions, a thousand years from now will be economically prosperous and individualistic, right? That's just not something you could possibly plan. Mm -hmm. It turns out that the economy is not something you can plan very, very well either, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. So <laughs> uh, let me just ask you a couple of questions about um, an article or a text that you wrote on Medium that was sure. about the virtues of conservatism. I don't have the mm -hmm. title here with me, but basically you focus on three points there. And the first one is humans are flawed, fallible creatures. And the three points that go associated with it are humans are tribal, humans favor kin slash local, and humans are competitive. So would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, yeah, so I think that's... I my view of conservatism is that that's the sort of fundamental axiom of conservatism. The religiously minded would call it original sin, right? This, this idea that humans are, we have an ideal vision of what humans could be and humans don't live up to it. We're, <laughs> we have all kinds of base motives. Some of those that we listed were tribal. You cannot create your, you will, if, if your political vision requires all humans getting together and sharing a common goal, your political vision is doomed to failure because humans will not do that. They will instead break apart into tribes that sometimes collaborate, but also that compete intensively. 
So I like to use the example of, it's sort of like a Lord of the Flies example, except for I think you want more people. So if you put 500 men into an auditorium and you locked them in there and you fed them through, say, the ceiling, you, I don't know, you dropped bags of Doritos in there so they could have food and you came back in two years, what would you expect to find? And I would submit what you would find is that the, the men would have broken apart into competing tribes and they would have either actually violently conflicted with each other, perhaps to the death, or they would have created some sort of alternative mechanism such as sports to compete against each other. So they would have been playing like fighting games or football type games or whatever. Why? Because the tribe is inside us. It's not out there. We will create it if we don't have it. Kin, so also the kin part, I think, is because it's so important to understand that it's really hard to create a society that, that practices rule of law and impartiality in which most people aren't just giving all of the benefits to their kin, in other words, in which you're not getting nepotism. To, to create a society that does that, which the West has done, is an amazing achievement and very fragile because when societies break apart, they break back apart into kin groups. And um, uh, Francis Fukuyama has this wonderful two book series, the rise of, like, I think it's like the rise of political order and maybe the fall of political, something like that. And he goes over this, how, how does society, like how hard it is to get past these just like kin networks. And then when society breaks apart, it breaks back apart into these kin networks. Um, I sort of think of it like a crystal. Like if you, if you break a crystal, it sort of breaks back into its rudimentary forms, right? That's what happens with a society. If you break it, it breaks into its more rudimentary or primitive forms, which are kin based. Um, and then, I mean, I guess the competitive part fits in with both of those, but which is to say also humans are individually competitive. So we're competing against each other for status and resources. And that means, that, you know, like any kind of communist vision in which humans are all getting along and sharing things is just a non-starter because humans will compete against each other to get more money, to get more power, to get more prestige, to get more women, to get more men, whatever it happens to be. And that's just a fundamental part of human nature that any serious political ideology has to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the second point, we've already gone through it. I guess reason is powerful, but prone to error. So let's go to the yeah. last one. Tradition and prejudice are often good guides to social policy. Yeah, that, that one, see, when people hear that prejudice is a good guide, they think, what? That's crazy, because prejudice sounds inevitably pejorative in mo to modern ears, but prejudice really just means prejudgment. And if you look at the, the sort of older conservatives, Edmund Burke, for example, when they would talk about prejudice, they weren't talking about you hate somebody who looks different from you or whatever. They were talking about prejudice in the sense that uh, if you see a lion, you're afraid. That's a prejudgment. You don't sit there and contemplate, hmm, the lion is six foot ten, it can run. You know, you don't have to go through that. You have an automatic assessment that lions are scary. I should probably be vigilant right now. I think that holds for all sorts of social phenomena. Um, we just have these sort of quick judgments about things, and those quick judgments are good, and it's good that we have to, have to, is putting it strongly, it's actually good that we rely on them, because people have this notion that, oh, if we only we reasoned more, look at all the disagreement reason leads to. Look at how often people are wrong. Can you imagine leaving nature to reason? <laughs> You're wrong and then you 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 know you misjudge how far you have to jump rationally because you're trying to calculate it and you fall and die. You calculate, oh, this lion's not scary, you get killed, whatever it may be. It's good that we have prejudices. Prejudices are that, that's sort of tied with tradition because tradition, so we have, I guess what we, we have are sort of like 
almost innate prejudices. I don't want to get into a huge debate about exactly what innate means, but that is to say prejudices that would develop in pretty much any normal human. And then we have prejudices that are instilled by society through tradition. Those are really good because they hold, they create a sort of glue for society in which individuals don't have to rethink everything or figure out that they love America or whatever, or freedom of speech is good. These are just things that are instilled in people at such an early age that they become prejudices. There's a show, it's a really cheesy show. It's called, What Would You Do? I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's on, I think it's on ABC or something with John Keonis. And it, they, they do these sort of social experiments where they'll have, uh, let's say a Muslim person will go into a store and then they've set it up so that the store clerk will insult her. And then they see what do the people around do. And it's actually kind of interesting. Assume, I mean, I assume they're sort of, you know, it's not science, but it's interesting to observe. And a lot of what I remember thinking about is I'd see these people would get really upset that the Muslims were getting insulted and they would say that you don't do that in america that was like their response to this and i thought you know that's a really they're not thinking about that they just have this very strong emotional uh sense that in america you treat people equally and fairly regardless right and you do this in other western countries i'm just using america because that's where it's shot that's a part of our tradition that's not something that a human would probably naturally arrive at that view. I don't think so. It's something you have to instill in the human. So that's what I'm saying there. Um, I actually have moved. I used to call myself a centrist. I now call myself a conservative. So I'm actually defending the views that I, I hold now. <laughs> I will say I'm a little more uh, progressive economically than maybe the average conservative, but I, I, I definitely think social conservatism is the most sort of accurate ideology to hold. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned tradition and prejudice, my last question will be, do you also include stereotypes in this equation or not? Well, that's a good question, and that's one that's designed to get me in trouble, and I like it, so I'm going to take it. And yes, the answer is yes. And I think this is, I wish that we could have more sensible conversations about these things, because stereotypes, I, I say, I used to say this to my students, we try to, I try to have like long, good discussions about stereotypes, but they're one, they're often accurate. There's plenty of research on this. And two, you couldn't exist as a functional organism if you didn't stereotype, right? So, in man, I, I mean, in some sense, like, if you're walking in the park and you're more afraid of a pit bull than a Yorkshire, that's a stereotype, right? You have a stereotype. Pit bulls are more ferocious, more prone to attacking than Yorkshire terriers or whatever. And that's a good stereotype. It's also a good stereotype to have that if you're walking on the street alone at night and there's a 40-year-old woman or a 40-year-old man, you should be more worried about the 40-year-old man, quite obviously. And I think we, we kind of all understand this privately, but you can see there are problems when you start to talk about it because sometimes those stereotypes are a little bit negative about groups that we consider victims groups. And that's where I would say, of course, there are challenges with stereotypes. And I'm not saying what we should do is create a bunch of a bunch more stereotypes and tell people just rely only on those. I think, however, in many situations, you should use stereotypical information um, even, even from a rational perspective, in fact, right? I mean, a good Bayesian reasoner would use base rates, i.e. stereotypes, to make assessments about the world. I would say this. In Western societies, we have attempted to, to 
promote an idea of individualism. That is, we treat people as individuals that I think is one of the greatest developments in sort of human in history, really. The, the notion that y you are not responsible for what your family members did and you should be treated as your own person. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes conflicts with using stereotypes. And if we have the luxury, we should work hard to treat people as individuals uh, when we can. And, and even, even if that means being a little bit irrational and not using base rates. So I'll give you an example that's concrete. Let's suppose that it's true that if I include race in my bank loan process, I make a more rational judgment about who should get loans. And that and let's figure let's assume here that African Americans are less likely to pay back loans even at equal credit scores with white people with with Caucasians. So, so I could use that information and say we're going to charge a little bit more interest to African Americans even if they have the same credit score. Mm -hmm. And that would actually be the rational stereotype using a stereotype it would be the rational decision to make i also think it would be unjust because i think it would promote treating people based on demographic characteristics in a way that i don't like which is by the way why i don't like affirmative action either because i think that does it so, so, sort of in a different way um so i'm willing even though I think, of course, we, we use tradition and intuition, and that means you're going to use stereotypes, of course, and let's try to have a reasonable conversation about that. When it comes to matters of like law or, or sort of commercial behavior, I think I'm willing to take the trade off and we'll be a little bit less efficient, but we also won't use demographic characteristics because that just creates invidious attitudes and comparisons that are harmful to a multi-ethnic society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, even in general, I guess that if we didn't have any stereotypes, we wouldn't be able to move in our social environments. We wouldn't be able even to interact uh, naturally and right. in expected ways with other people the, the, exactly. the, in, in any sort of social context or situation. Right. I, 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 um, I, I, at Florida State, I, there was a professor there who was a prejudice researcher and she was really awesome. And I used to talk to her about this and I'd, and I'd say, well, you know, like Im imagine that I don't have stereotypes and I encounter an 18 year old kid a 50 year old dude and a 30 year old woman and i treat all three of them exactly the same when i first start talking to them that would be such a violation of social decor because we know you talk to an 18 year old a little bit differently from the way you talk to a 50 year old and you talk to a 35 year old woman differently from how you talk to your you know your 27 year old dude buddy or it's, it's just like if you didn't have these stereotypes you wouldn't have friends because you would be such an uncouth person. Now, what you what you also do is let, let's say, so here's a stereotype I think I probably have. On average, men are probably a little bit more friendly to sort of ironic banter and to making fun of each other on average. But if I meet a woman who's clearly into that, then I will participate. So what we do is we sort of start with this stereotype and we're a little bit cautious and we're like, okay, I'm going to see how this goes. And then we use what psychologists would call individuating data or information and we tailor our behavior to each individual. What I think is the pernicious thing and what should count as racism, but of course the definition of racism has expanded and bloated so much that it covers almost everything now. What, what real racism is, is if I think, uh, let's say I think that Asians are slightly worse drivers. That's a stereotype I have. And let's say I'm with an Asian driver who's awesome at driving. And I'm like, I don't want you to drive because you're Asian. That's racism, right? That's yeah. I'm treating this person as a member of this category, despite obvious evidence that they're actually good at something or whatever. So to me, that's what we should reserve the phrase racism for. Not the belief that different 
groups and different age groups, different sexes, different ethnic groups are different. That's, you know, that's just true. And to not have stereotypes about that. It, I've, often, I've, I've said before, it's, it's, it's an intellectual argument for self lobotomy. It's like you, you're being asked, right, to destroy part of your brain tissue so that you don't see patterns that exist in the world. I just think that's really unfair to ask people. And it's totally unnecessary because we can promote messages of tolerance while still using stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but I think that we've already mentioned this aspect earlier in the interview, but the same people that condemn stereotypes or people who use stereotypes are using them, but uh, toward the groups that they are against, like, for example, white, white, <laughs> white males or whatever, because they, yeah, also, and, and I mean, <laughs> they also hold these different stereotypes, right? Not only are they using them, but I would submit that they're using stereotypes that are probably less accurate and more nasty than many of the stereotypes I've ever heard about other groups, right? I mean, it, it is, you're right, it is, and it's weird. I mean, the what I remember, there's this, I wish I could remember, there was a Pixar movie, a Disney movie, in which they had, something happened and somehow this thing landed into a trailer park. And, and it was this, you know, they depicted this, this the stereotypical, like, quote, white trailer trash in this Disney movie, this Pixar movie, and I thought, you know, it's interesting. That's like the one group that it's okay to ridicule quite publicly, like white, lower class whites. Like if you if you did that and you had it land in, in a stereotypical like ghetto with like gang members who were black, I think most people would be like, that's a, what's that doing in this Disney movie? That's terrible. But that it's this white group of the lower class, that's perfectly fine. Um, I mean, personally, I think we should all have more of a sense of humor. I'm not saying I'm offended by that. It's just the double standard that we've talked about that's more offensive to me. I think we should, in some sense, lighten up to joking about groups more, but I, without, you know, you don't have to say abolish whiteness or whatever. That, that I don't, I mean, that's a little bit of a different story, right? I mean, that's a, a bizarre thing. We should have a whole podcast on abolish whiteness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So let, let's think about that. Perhaps somewhere in the future we could do that. So, and Bo, just before we go, uh, would you like to leave any final message about social conservatism, something that we haven't mentioned here yet? Or Yeah, that's a good question. I, here, I guess here's what I would say. I would say um, most people who uh, are interested in education and get into politics and, and they... they often have uh, a negative view of social conservatism. It just seems kind of backward and it, it relies on prejudice and it just justifies like the sort of normal primitive tendencies of humans. And I think nothing could be further from the truth. And, and what helped me and what I'm really thankful for is that I was always somebody who wanted to read the other side. And I was a very radical leftist when I was younger. I loved like Tom Paine and Noam Chomsky, um, etc. But I, I remember reading arguments against Edmund Burke from Tom Paine. And I thought, who's this Edmund Burke guy, you know, because people are talking about the conservatism of Burke. So I got into Edmund Burke, and I just started reading them. And then to my surprise, even back then, when I was still, I remained pretty radical for a long time, but I, I, I really found Burke persuasive. And so I got into social conservatism through Edmund Burke and other people. And then I started reading um, Russell Kirk and, um, you know, Roger Scruton, et cetera, et cetera. And I just found the thought, this sounds cheesy, but in a sense, beautiful. There's something beautiful about the idea that we should preserve, we should work hard to preserve what has worked. That's kind of the, the sort of social conservative view. And so it really is intellectually sophisticated. You just have to find the right things to read. And because it's not depicted, I think, fairly in the mainstream media, most people get a very narrow and tendentious view of what it is. And 
I would urge listeners to go out and seek the original text, find Edmund Burke, find uh, Roger Scruton, find these people and read them because they make wonderful arguments, even if you disagree with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Bo, where can people find you on the internet? And is your Cephalopod podcast still running? or, or It not? is coming back. It is coming back. So I'm happy to say that it will be back. Um, I don't know. It, it may be another week. It may be a couple of weeks. We've got some things to figure out. But it's definitely coming back probably more often than before. And then um, I'm on Twitter at EPO, that is E and then Edgar Allan as in as Edgar Allan Poe 187 and uh, I've I've been canceled from my job so I have more free time so I'm doing blogging and stuff so I hope people will pay attention to that and maybe they'll go to my Patreon because that's the only income I have these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I will be leaving all of that in the description box of the interview. All right, thank it you, was, man. it was really, really nice to talk to you again. So let's hope yeah, that somewhere in the it, future, man. we Absolutely. gather together again to do another one. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. And I also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and main supporters, Karin Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klingpi, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalanias, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Marco Neves, Max Belby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spigny, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Labrant, Os Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardus France, David Sloan Wilson, and the Asila Deza Araujo, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Verge, Vega Gidi, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.